crack saw set up with one of the little, the little panel cutting reverse <laughs> blades on it. It has that feature for like uh, cutting veneer like you would have on a, a sliding table saw. So uh, he should invest in about $1,500 worth of equipment <laughs> to, make his, to make his $50 doors. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses, even folks who care just a little. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today, I'm joined by Editorial Director Brian Pontalillo. Hey, Patrick. Good hey, to see everyone. you, Brian. Good to be here. Digital Brand Manager Rob Watsack. Hello. And our producer, Jeff Rose. Hi there. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at findhomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, it's a pleasure to see you fellas today. What's been going on? What has been going on? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We, we kind of got this last minute call to come do a podcast. We're all like, hopefully do a good job here. I don't know. <laughs> I'm hoping for the best, buddy. You know, when we, have, if, when we have good conversations about the questions before we start recording, I get nervous. <laughs> because you think you, we've used up all our content, Brian? Well, like, how can we, we, we you know, you could, we definitely won't be able to replicate those conversations when the, when the, when the, when the, pressure's rolling, on, when the tape yeah. is rolling. Oh, yeah, come on. Sure. They'll, they'll only be better than before. <laughs> anyway, if, if you meant what am I doing other than being on podcasts, uh, I think you saw uh, pictures of my new fire pit in my patio. Yeah, you're trying in the to backyard. set a world yeah. record for the world's heaviest fire ring, near as I can tell. Well, so Andy Engel gave me these eight inch wide, three eighths inch thick pieces of plate <laughs> steel that were like seven feet long. And what does uh, that weigh, Rob? What is that? I, I had a hard time lifting each one by myself. So, and I, <laughs> I made the fire pit out of three of them plus a pile of angle iron. So yeah. uh, I was like, what am I going to build with this thing? I, I was, I, I was going to build a bench, but then I, I really wanted a fire pit. So I, um, we had this idea that we would just, eight inches wasn't tall enough for the fire pit to use them on their side. So I was like, well, I'll just cut them into whatever height I want and just kind of stitch them together at the edges with some such interesting detail. And uh, what we came up with was I cut them at, I think, 14 inches tall and then uh, used pieces of angle iron sort of tucked in behind them, all welded on the inside. So you can't see any of the welds or seams from the outside of the thing. And I made it sort of in an, like a football shape because I wanted it to be kind of more squished in the shape on, on my patio to get us closer together. And I went in SketchUp and I drew it, I, I drew it, I drew it out and um, decided what gaps I wanted and about how big I wanted it. And I, it was awesome. I came up with these just cut out of two by fours. I came up with the angle was like 157 degrees between each of the panels. And I made these two little pieces I cut out of uh, two by four that I clamped to the to the um, panels and the thing welded up perfectly. Like when I got, I've made the two halves separately. And when I got to both ends, it just lined up perfectly. And it was it's honestly- a beautiful thing, dude. You should be very you. proud of it. It's really cool. And I love that it's made from stuff that no one was using. That's really neat. Yeah, I try to do that as much as possible. I know that about you. <laughs> <laughs> what was what was Andy Engel doing with all that? Uh, all so that so he he's working on this old house that um, you've seen the movie Beetlejuice, right? Yeah. So in the movie Beetlejuice, they had that classic old farmhouse, and they were like these city people. They went in and made it all modern. Well, he's undoing somebody's prior work similar to that in this big old farmhouse. So he ripped out a bunch of metal stuff that was like super modern that totally didn't go with the house. And uh, it was mm. easier for him to call me to just come pick it up than it was for him to scrap it. So looks great, dude. Score. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Jeff, do you have anything to share? No, I've just been working out in the yard and on the lawn and stuff like that. So folks should know that it's definitely springtime here in southern New England. Trees are budding and. The forsythia is out. The weeds are popping up in my lawn. It looks great. <laughs> Pollen is starting to bloom. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. I think so I'm I did, oh, go did ahead. something this weekend that has been weighing on me since uh, our big uh, straight line windstorm that took out all my oak trees on the property. I had what was left of a mature oak, about 80 years old, we figured. Um, a 20-foot tall 
about 24 plus inches in diameter log that was standing. And it was almost perfectly straight. So it concerned me very much to cut it because sometimes when you start cutting into something that's perfectly straight like that, it doesn't go anywhere and just stalls the saw and gets on the chainsaw bar. And it's you're not going to get it out of there. You know, it's, it's a big problem. So I took the opportunity to buy a 30-foot blue toe strap, which is absolutely beautifully blue, and a 4,000-pound uh, come-along. And I put up a ladder and put the toe strap up in the top of this log and then connected the um, other end to the come-along and the other end of the come-along to a big pine tree that was reasonably close. And I cut this thing down and then uh, or I made a you know, notch cut in it and then made the felling cut almost away, all the way through it and then put the saw down and went to my come along and pulled the sucker over and it was one of the happiest moments of my entire life. <laughs> mm. I, I was very thankful, Patrick, to hear that you strapped it to a tree because I was, I was picturing one of those YouTube videos where there's a humongous tree tied to a tiny pickup truck and the, <laughs> and the pickup truck moves but the tree doesn't. <laughs> I've made, uh, you know, a hobby out of watching tree felling fail videos on the internet. So, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about. Or it falls right onto the truck, you know. Like, you wonder what these people are thinking. What was worse to me uh, than getting injured or, you know, having this thing hung up on my saw and my saw stuck there was the sheer embarrassment of having it go wrong because I was on full display of the entire neighborhood and, uh, you know, of course, they would never let me live this down if it went sideways. So it, it, I was very pleased it went okay. Have you but, done anything? Uh, have you cut a log that big, Brian? Um, I, I, I don't know if I've cut anything myself that big, but I worked. Um, I did some work with people over the years. I worked for a logger one winter. Right. Um, and, the, and then, um, but that was in, that was on, you know, on the edges of Iowa farm fields. Where, you know, so we, we weren't really too, I mean, you know, he knew where he needed to lay things down, but, you know, so that they didn't get hung up by other trees, but we weren't, you know, there wasn't risk to property or, you know, other stuff like that. My job was mostly to drive the skitter and pull the stuff out of the, you know, out into the field to be bucked before, uh, after he cut them been an awesome job <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoyed it yeah and then i and then I, I also worked for a landscape construction company we did quite a bit of tree removal um and you know we always took a very similar approach to what you just described none of us were professionals at you know at cutting trees we always used um we always used ropes and often you know connected to the backhoe just to sort of nudge the tree in the direction we needed it to fall you know um it just feels safer be doing that, especially if you're not highly skilled with, with yeah. dropping trees and yeah. I, uh, I was trying to think of something that humans deal with that's heavier than logs. And I couldn't think of anything really. Like there's nothing that we move as people, uh, that's heavier than that stuff. Right. I the mean, logger, masonry maybe, but yeah, in, in the logger that I worked for in his home, he had a, a really fra he had this beautiful framed poster that, um, had all this information about, about logs and about trees. And it, one of the things that was astounding to me, and I wish I could quote some of it now, but this is, you know, this is almost 20 years ago, uh, were, were the weights yeah. of, of wet, of wet live, live, you know, logs, live trees. Thousands of pounds, remarkable. right? Yeah, it's remarkable. That, that's the thing that I always wonder is how people see that thing standing there and underestimate how heavy the thing really is. Like the thought that you could actually pull a four foot diameter, 80 foot tall tree <laughs> in any direction with a 1500, you know, with a 5,000 pound pickup truck, you know? <laughs> I, uh, I was so happy when that thing hit the ground. Oh, we had some great feedback as always. Uh, so this comes from Kevin. Oh, I, you, know, you wanted to talk about something, Brian. I'm so sorry. Uh, we have I a did. new project guide. Yeah, we have uh, the insulation project guide. So, and that seems so appropriate for this show. <laughs> <laughs> that's appropriate for the show. Yeah, I mean, we're just we're Robin and the team are doing a just a dynamite job of of set of uh, producing these project guides. And uh, if you haven't been on our website in a while, it's just sort of a you know it's just uh, a new way to look at and to navigate through our content that puts it together by topic. And we've also brought in a whole bunch of new content in each of the topics from books and other sources. So really, um, 
you know, we've, we're finding a way this is, this has been a, this is project that we've, you know, we kind, kind of talked about for a long time and just kind of got rolling, but we're finding a way just to make the website much more, um, much more useful to someone who is about to engage in a particular project or a particular aspect of the build. And, you know, what's great is, is that we know it's working. Um, we know people are appreciating it because we're seeing, um, we're seeing traffic and page views on those sections of the, of the, um, and like time on pages and all the statistics that we look at for, you know, to see how our website is performing. We're seeing them all kind of grow in positive ways. And, um, you know, for us, it's just, and I think Rob can speak more to this than I can, but for us, it's just, you know, it's the challenge of wanting our website to be as helpful to people as possible. It's great that we have all this, you know, that we have 40 years of awesome content, but, you know, sometimes if you can't find it, it's no help. And right. so, so we're just trying to make the website as useful as possible. You know what I love about our website is that it's so uncluttered compared to some other, like the video things that pop up and, oh my God, that stuff drives me insane. Like right, right, right while you're reading something, an ad will just like float over whatever you're reading. And that drives me nuts. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so one thing uh, also, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, I, unfortunately, you know, we got to stay in business and other, other websites do too. And as unfortunate as ads and memberships are, that's, that's how we get to do what we do. Uh, we're so much better about it than other companies. Well, I, I got to so. say, we do have yeah. some, we do have some standards and we do turn away ads that aren't appropriate and have some, we try to, we try to make some rules about like how many ads we will put in front of someone's face, you know, in, in relationship to how much time they're on the site or how many pages they're viewing. And we, you know, we, we try to think about that and not just, not just overdo it. Well, let me about? just talk. Uh, yeah, I was just going to mention the project guy. First of all, the, a, anytime you're looking for the project guys, just go straight to findhomeland.com and about halfway down the, the homepage is a big box that takes you to any to our all our project guides. Uh, and so the installation guide is a little bit of a misnomer. We wanted to give it a simple name, but basically it covers a, 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 bro, a broader uh, topic. Of course, it covers air sealing. So that, uh, our listeners will be happy about that. <laughs> they were going to uh, ask, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's a there's a chapter that's just on energy efficiency in general. So it talks about you know what passive houses, or wall you know wall design strategies. It, you know, it's basically any of the articles we've had on what you need to really think about because you know like we all talk about all the time you don't you don't think about a house as a single part by itself you got to think of it as a system so uh, there's a lot of great articles in there and then as you get further in there's articles on choosing insulation and then there's also a more of sort of sort of a water management or a chapter that covers uh, WRBs and flashing and and that sort of thing we heard from Kevin about finding good contractors, which we talked about in uh, episode three forty four. Were you guys on that show by chance? Um, yeah, I think we. I think I was. So the just was it. This guy hired a plumber who did a, a crappy job on his uh, sewer ejector pump. <laughs> Sorry for the. <laughs> I'm not a contractor. I'm an automotive technician for the last eighteen years. Our industry has the same issues that every other trade has. Anyone can pick up a wrench and think they can fix a car. I would say if you're looking for a good tradesperson, try going through Instagram or YouTube. I feel like the people that take the time to be involved in posting content and posting how-to content have nothing to hide. Just look at the Modern Craftsman podcast and the people they have on. I know it sounds so millennial to say so, but it's worth a shot. Love the show, Kevin. I think that's a great idea, but I think Kevin would agree that there's just not that many people you know, that you could go to on Instagram, right? It's limited by geography and all these things, right? You'd be surprised, though, because, uh, you know, the, the smartest ones will tag their posts by location. And uh, one of my friends who's a local carpenter that I've worked with on and off for over the years, uh, he gets almost all of his work through Instagram. He just posts really nice photos of the projects he's working on, prog progress shots, nothing fancy. You know, he, he doesn't go into detail about them, just sort of, you know, a little snapshot into his the types of stuff he does. And uh uh, you know, we're up here in uh, Western Connecticut, and we've got a lot of. Uh, he works on a lot of antique homes, and 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 so we've got a lot of uh, 
people from down in the cities who have weekend homes up here and are apparently on Instagram. And that's really where he gets a lot of his work. So, I mean, I'd say certainly look, search for terms based on your location and you might find your local contractors more easily that way if they're on Instagram. Jeff and Brian, what do you guys think of this? I think you still got to get the some sort of reference. I mean, we can, anyone can make their social media account look however they want it to look. And that doesn't mean <laughs> that the client had a good experience. And that doesn't mean that the, hey, if, it's, if you're only showing beauty shots, that doesn't even mean the work was necessarily done well. So, because you're just showing so the think, end of it. I mean, I think he's, I think he, his suggestion is a good one. Like, you know, you use these, you know, use these as resources to find people. And I'm, so all I'm adding to that is that the next level is to say, hey, do you have some clients I can call or do some, do something more than that? Yeah. You so know, you're using you it really, more like a really phone book. Feel, if you really want to feel good about it. What do you yeah, think, so you, Jeff? I, you know, I, I agree with all that. And I think it's, you know, depending upon where you live, it's, going to narrow that field down <laughs> tremendously right, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah what were you gonna say ron i was just saying yeah like like brian to, just to sort of elaborate on what brian was saying you don't that's not a way to vet them but it's maybe a way to find them sure well First thanks step. for the feedback kevin I, I think it's pretty cool we have auto technicians that listen to the show we might have i might have questions for you kevin <laughs> <laughs> hello, fine. <laughs> hello, fine fence building podcast crew. I've been listening to the podcast for a few years now, and I enjoy it very much. Over the last few weeks, there's been a lot of conversation about fences and fence posts. Living in Tornado Alley, I've seen my share of fence panels and posts destroyed by wind, including metal posts. Several years ago, I was putting up a new metal fence post and pouring a new curb under the fence at the same time. I was thinking how much trouble it would be to break up the curb to replace the damaged post in the future. So I went to the big box store on a mission and discovered that the inside diameter of two and a half inch electrical conduit was one eighth inch bigger than the OD on a standard fence post. So I bought a few 10 foot sticks of conduit, took them home and cut them into 30 inch pieces. Then about three inches from the end, I drilled a half inch hole all the way through and put in an old bolt or a short piece of rebar, whatever I had lying around. So it stuck out about an inch on each side of the conduit. This was to keep the post from sliding through to the ground and sinking in over time, causing the fence to sag. I also kept the conduit, it also kept the conduit from sliding into the concrete. Then I dug a hole as normal, added a little gravel in the bottom, slid the pole into the conduit, put it in the hole, filled it with concrete, aligned, leveled, etc. Once the concrete was set, I slid the pole back out and took a saw and cut the conduit off level with the top of the new curb and then slid the poles back in. So now if a pole ever gets damaged or I just want to remove a section of fence for some reason, no problem. After this, I've started using this method for all my metal poles, even if they were just a standalone post with no curb. David, that sounds like a uh, tips and techniques, doesn't it, Brian? That's that exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I, great I, idea. I love this idea. Yeah, I've, I've, I've like, I love modular stuff. I mean, it's like I've got fence, fences on my... Uh, uh, veg garden out of hog panels that are hanging on hooks. So if I need to weed whack over there, I can just lift the fence panel off. So like anytime you can make something easily removable and repairable. Especially anyway, fences so in sense. your yard, right? Because yeah. you never know what you're going to need to do. Maybe the tree crew is going to have to come in. Maybe you're going to have to dig a, you know, electrical line or whatever, right? Yeah, that's smart. The only thing I worry about a little bit with regard to this is the conduit rusting. You know, and, and I'm sure there's different degrees of galvanization for that stuff. But if that thing started to rust, it's going to lock that fence post in there and you're not going to get it out, right? Yeah. I mean, you might want to add some additional coating or, or, or something in there. Maybe it's even some sort of a, like the stuff they spray on the underside of the buses. You know, what is that stuff called? That uh... Cosmoline. Well, no, there's there's like newer versions of that stuff, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, some sort of a some sort of a rust inhibitor or even a, a zinc spray paint. You know, you can get that like uh, sort of uh, galvanized, fake galvanized spray paint. But yeah, I because mean, I've thought of a similar thing where you'd put stainless steel posts in the in the in like a step. Would that that be a little bit better? But it's more expensive. Cool idea. This comes from George. Dear FHB podcasters. 
I listened to engineer Matt's feedback on electric vehicles and natural gas appliances in episode 344. As an electrical engineer also in the power sector, I feel the need to respond succinctly. I don't know, guys, that sounds like an engineering smackdown to me if they're, you know, like totally <laughs> or maybe a call. I don't know. Anyway, so EV, EVs have less CO2 emissions when being charged off the grid in every state in the great old U.S. of A., even in coal heavy states like Wyoming, West Virginia and Ohio. There may be some granularity by zip code, but I don't have the data right off the bat. My source is the alternative fuels database run by the Department of Energy. EVs with vehicle-to-grid technology will change the way people interact with their electric company in ways that are completely bonkers. Imagine your vehicle's battery buffering the load from your hairdryer or AC unit to avoid peak demand charges, or selling battery power to the grid to avoid a grid blackout, or soaking up cheap noonday sun or late-night gusty winds, or even providing emergency power during the event of an outage. Examples already seen during the Texas deep freeze this year, and this is just the stuff we can see now. The whole argument of energy use efficiency misses the point. Even if fossil fuels were 100% efficient, they still produce greenhouse gases, gases, sulfur oxides and nitrous oxides, particulate matter and air quality pollutants to surrounding communities, and leave huge brownfields where the power facilities are located to be cleaned up by taxpayers. They also come with a lovely supply chain and geopolitical concerns all throughout their extraction, refinement, and transportation. In summary, why in heavens do we power our vehicles and homes from dirty crap that comes from Venezuela, Russia, and Saudi Arabia? So I would say that our power generation fossil fuels are not coming from Russia, Saudi Arabia, or Venezuela, but I, you know, I get his point. Uh, these things pollute our soil and countryside when we can do it from the wind in Nebraska and sunshine in Arizona. The grid is getting cleaner every day and the building sector needs to get wise about carbon. I can't see why any new residential building in America should get a new gas line installed. After all, 2050 is only 29 years away. Thanks so much and love the show, George. Wow, we need to have a couple of engineers on this show, right? Yeah, weren't, weren't you talking the other day, Patrick, too, about uh hearing about the idea of using um, vehicles in homes that are plugged into chargers as buffers for the grid too, because that's one of the big thing, big problems with, with, uh, salt, with renewable energy is that it fluctuates in a way that they can't predict. And so you need to, I mean, the usage always has to match the production in an electrical grid. So um, basically by having electrical vehicles connected to a central brain maybe in your neighborhood um you might be able to buffer them i know there's there, i know there's already uh like battery pack buffer zones uh put into some local places that are based on used yeah we, uh, we heard from a listener in vermont who's got power walls that were put in by his utility and their rationale was to help uh cut costs when they have to buy power on the open market right they can draw from their customers who have these things instead of having to pay you know, the highest rates from another utility. Yeah. I think it's pretty cool. I'd, I'd love to see this happen. Uh, you know, we're not there yet. I think you'd all agree. I guess the one thing that, you know, in our, in our sort of like uh, very uh, selfish environment is does doing that um, wear, put wear and tear on your battery that if you were super careful with how you charged your battery in your car, you'd get more life out of the battery, you know? Oh, that's just like you, Rob, looking out for yourself. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, I'm all for crowdsourcing that stuff, but I'm sure it's going to be a good question that will come up. I don't know how the people are going to pay for it. I think utilities are going to have to buck up, right? Like who the heck has, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to buy, you know, power walls. Yeah, I just meant if people are use, buying electric cars and power walls and then the local utility says, oh, we're going to borrow your power wall as a buffer for our for our grid for your neighbors. You know, that's the sort of thing that I wonder about. Were you going to say something, Brian? It looked like you were. You no, know, I mean, it's, it's super interesting to me, the idea that, you know, that we, you know, down the road, we may be using our homes and our vehicles as part of. Um, the grid in other buildings and all sorts of all sorts of existing kind of um, or 
infrastructure that we have right under our nose right now could become part of a you know become part of a smart and and sustainable and climate friendly you know grid that's that's fascinating um, to think about the the specifics of it are just beyond me of course <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's and it's a perfect example of how paradigm shifts work because people make predictions about the future based on their current knowledge of technology. And, you know, there's some there's some pretty amazing battery technology potentially on the horizon in the next few years, even that could totally change the way we think about power electric cars and powering our homes. So, you know, who knows? You know, in yeah. our, our country's brief history, we've seen things that have changed the whole situation very quickly. Like at the early part of the 20th century, like nobody had a car. But then, you know, 50 years later, everybody had a car. And if you look at, you know, smartphones, that the adoption was even faster. That was like a matter of years, it seems like, right? It's still, there's still brand new <laughs> smartphones, right? 2008, <laughs> the iPhone came out. Yeah. I mean, and, and and it's hard to think of life before, before that. that. Yeah. yeah, it is remarkable, Patrick. Okay. This comes from Alex, and Alex is in La Prairie, Quebec. Hello, I listen to many FHB podcasts, but unfortunately not all of them. So if my question is redundant, I apologize. This question relates to my project at rebuilding the front porch of my house as it was a century ago, but with today's techniques. As you can see on the attached drawings, the lower deck will have a tongue and groove pine or cedar floor, and the upper deck balcony will have a fiberglass floor. Otherwise, everything will be built out of white pine. My concern is about anchoring the post to the balcony floor. I really want it to be solid and protected from rot. I'm not a fan of toenailing, so I thought maybe using a lag bolt from, underside, from the underside might be better. When I install wood columns on a deck, I usually insert a one-inch piece of white cedar between the base of the column and the floor to prevent rot. I may be able to do the same for the post, but maybe there are better solutions. What do you suggest? Thank you, and keep up the good work. So Alex, I just want to say your ambition for rebuilding this porch is uh, quite impressive, and it's a beautiful place. I, I applaud you, and I wish you great success, and I hope you enjoy it, because it's pretty cool finished carpentry. I think you guys would agree. Yeah, for anyone who's who's listening to this and can't you know see these the visuals, um, the porch is uh, this is a historic house, and the porch is just it's just ornate and really stunning. With you know, it, I mean, from the drawing, it looks like with just sort of turned columns and these really decorative railings and finials on the on the posts above. Um, it's it's just it is an ambitious project, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's very Victorian. I think we uh, describe the uh, architectural style, right? Um, I think so. Yeah. I mean, definitely the, definitely the porch feels Victorian. The, the house is quite unique, but I guess it's Victorian. So it, this is a good question. And I, we were talking about the, this uh, ahead of the show. And one of my uh, carpenter buddies when I was working in Pittsburgh said, you know, Porches keep carpenters in business because if you live in a place with housing stock of a certain era and they have porches, like they're always rotten. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> yeah, because they're outdoors, right? Right. And water sits on them. And a lot so, of details. Yeah. So I think they probably have, they probably tend to have even, even though they have a roof over them, I, I feel like maybe they tend to have even more issues than decks, right? Because there's a lot of details, a lot of places water can get trapped. And, you and know, the skirting to, prevents drying, dry. right? Exactly. The skirting prevents drying. They probably don't get as much sun as decks. So yeah, port, porch rot is definitely a common, is definitely common home repair. Yeah. So, I mean, it, I mean, basically the, the strategy to, to make a porch last longer is to not have wood sitting in places where it can sit in water for long periods of time. So pitching things well, um, if you, if you're not too concerned about like hiding some more modern details, like I know a lot of porch posts, you can use those plastic little, uh, shims that go underneath. It's like a little block that goes underneath the porch post so that just the bottom edge of it is plastic where it's contacting the decking. Um, and you know, put some kind of skirting around it or whatever to hide it. Right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I, it looks like his has some kind of slender, very straight, 
uh, bases to, and one of the most challenging parts of his porch is that it does have a roof, but then there's a porch on top of the roof and those posts are all exposed to the weather. So I, that's, I think the ones he's probably most concerned about. Um, we had a detail know. on the, we had a detail in fine home building. I think it might've been, I think it might've been from John Michael Davis, who's a carpenter in new Orleans who wrote for us for a while and, and did lots of restoration and repair work. And uh, the detail includes a, a rabbit around the, around the edges of post the bottoms of posts so that he could use baccarat and caulk around the bases. I've also seen um, the the detail you just described, Rob, and I've also seen a lot of porches on newer houses where there's just, um, there's some sort of a shim or something actually holding the post up from the framing. Mm -hmm. You know, there'll just be this For little sure. shadow. You'll notice this little shadow line and the post will actually be held up like, you know, an eighth of an inch or something from the, from the floor. Let's yeah. So I I'd like to address Alex a specific question about attaching the uh, guardrail post for the balcony. And he mentioned toe screws or toenails, and that's a, a definite no-go. This, this has got to be strong. You can't have people falling off the porch. Maybe fasteners from the bottom side into the bottom of the post is better a little, but once again, it's not a good connection because it's an end grain, which is dubious. My preference would be to tie that to the flooring system uh, yeah. right. You need to do that. And there are, there are established details for guardrail posts for, um, decks that are in the DCA six. Is that the right six? Is that the right number guys? DCA six, nine, 10, the, 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 the decks, uh, periodical, right? The decks guide. And, uh, the, the, you need to do this because that can't fail when people are up there leaning on the railing, right? Yeah. Cause it, that, that, you know the por the posts down below are locked into the into the roof framing, so it's a little bit different. But the posts above are like a freestanding railing. And and you know Mike Curtin had that recent article in our in the magazine about uh, de deck rail post uh, connections. And I mean it sounds like um, Alex is trying to do a surface mounted post, so he's not penetrating that roof. But really, what needs to happen is those posts frame those posts should penetrate that roof. And they then there should be a flashing detail of some sort uh, to to make the the roof to, uh, waterproof around them, similar to the way you would do a flat roof uh, with EPDM or, or whatever whatever it is. So they're they're probably I would say those posts probably need to be rabbited in to or or they need to have a decorative cover over them and have a have a you know like a pressure treated post on the inside. But it sounds like he wants to replace this thing as close to original. So it's going to have to come up with some way to flash those posts to that, to that roof. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, I don't know if I would almost treat it kind of like the way you're flashing a, a chimney where you've got a piece of whatever the flashing material that goes up and then is led into the post just a little bit uh, in order to shed the water, because he's obviously not going to glue EPDM flashing or, or, or whatever that is compatible with this fiberglass decking system there. So and I, I should have got more clarification from Alex, but I'm not exactly sure what he means by fiberglass. So on the East Coast, like New Jersey, Cape May area and Maryland and probably into the Carolinas, folks who live like right on the beach have uh, second story decks with living space below. And the common way to make it waterproof is to build what amounts to a boat on your uh, bottom on the floor of your deck with fiberglass and fiberglass resin. And there are experts who make these waterproof fiberglass surfaces. And it's pretty e easy to integrate um, rail posts and uh, stair openings and that kind of stuff, because you can mold this when this uh, fiber and during this fiberglass process, and you can make these things watertight because the fiberglass is, you know, flexible anyway. So I think that's what he's talking about. And somebody who's really good about that could, um, waterproof the guardrail posts with those uh, who was doing that. Yeah, and if he wants it to look like there's nothing going on there, I imagine you could basically cut in, uh, you know, an eighth of an inch or whatever the thickness of that material is around the entire post up a certain height and basically fiberglass up the post. And then uh, that'll be, you know, a flush detail that won't be noticeable from the ground. Or maybe, it is, maybe if it only has to go up a couple of inches, it isn't going to be even visible from the ground. This is a complex uh, 
project. And we've only touched on a couple of things. The other thing you need to be wor worried about is you need to have a good connection between the top of the post that's supporting the balcony uh, to the balcony itself because of uplift. You know, there, there's a lot of force uh, with when you have a flat surface that air can't get through. Even right. if it's just moving across it quickly, you're going to have a negative air pressure and these things can lift up. So, I mean, this, this is a, not something you want to take lightly building this. And you asked the question, Brian, ahead of recording, you know, mo the traditional thing to do is to run porch flooring perpendicular to the front of the house, right? And that means your joists have to run parallel to the front of the house. And that's not how most decks are framed, and it's not the prescriptive way decks are framed. So you have to either put in blocking and frame the porch like you would a deck to fasten the flooring to, or you have to run the joist the other way, which means you need some kind of uh, intermediate girder, most likely, right? Because the spans would be too big otherwise. Yeah. And making that connection to a ledger uh, is not part of the prescriptive code. Rob made the point you could let it into the foundation or have it bear on directly on the foundation or have a post or something to get the load down. But this is a complicated thing to build a two-story porch. I think you'd agree. I think I'm doing yeah. too much talking because you guys are just like, oh my God, <laughs> yeah, shut up. No, I mean, yeah, it basically what it comes down to is that it, it, it's like if I were doing this project, I would basically address all of the framing using modern methods for anything that could be hidden. And then I would, um, then I would do my best to come up with details, flashing details, uh, whatever to cover up any of that, that those modern, those modern details. But, uh, you basically have to start with treating it like a modern, a modern framing project and figure out a way to integrate your decorative details in a way that it looks authentic. I don't exactly know where La Prairie, Quebec is, but Alex is going to have crazy snow loads too, right? You know, uh, most of the country or the U.S. Um, can get away with 40-pound uh, loading, but if you live in snow country, you have to uh, build things way more stout to account for uh, snow and worse when you have a bunch of snow that then gets soaking wet from a rain, so... Good luck, Alex. Keep us posted and send us photographs of your project. Uh, Alex uh, wrote in closing here, is like, yes, this is my old house that I'm slowly trying to store thanks to my girlfriend's patience and understanding. <laughs> I hope she's wealthy too. <laughs> um, this comes from Wayne. First, great job on the podcast. I'm a novice woodworker. However, I've built fences, gates, decks, built in book and cases, inset cabinets, etc. I have a 1997 bungalow style house with clear finished hollow corridors. Sizes range from 1.6 to 2.6 in the bedrooms. In 2012, I added a two story addition using pre prime two panel shaker doors. I want to mod modify them to match the new two panel style rails, rail and style doors in the addition. I've seen online how to cut the door faces with a track saw to create a four sided opening for panels to be inserted. I'm stumped how to finish the perimeter of the recesses on four sides, and I don't want the modifications to be visible. The finished doors will be prepared and painted white to match the additions doors. Thank you, Wayne. So I'm going you, to, you, what do you guys try and describe what Wayne wants to do? It's, it's kind of a cool thing. So, so you're saying he, he wants to mimic what he saw in that YouTube video. Is that yeah. right? So basically someone took a hollow core door and they cut out holes in the shape of the panels that they wanted to, to mimic a, a typical traditional style and rail and style door that has pa inset panels. And what this person did in the video was they, they, the same way when you cut a bottom of a hollow core door too high, you have to pack it in with a piece of solid wood. They basically packed in the perimeter of those holes and then put stops in and, and a panel and then another set of stops and basically sandwiched all of that in the same way you would put panes of w glass in a, in, a, in a window or something like that. And so. I know there's a certain percentage of our listeners who were like, that is a wacky idea. And I thought the same thing, but the res result looked great. I think you'd agree. Um, so there you have it. And and the, and the point that I made is that, yeah, so that's maybe not the 
the ideal or, or way or the typical way that someone would make a door like this. But if you've got more time than money, it's not a bad way. I mean, a couple of scraps of wood for the stops and uh, and panels and um, and a cheap hollow core door. And, and you know, I, I, I don't see why you can't make that look like one of these new super modern sort of shaker style flat panel doors because it, there's a couple of ways I would think of doing it to make it so you didn't see the edges. One is to just do a really good job of cutting some square stops if you want a true just square edge flat panel doors and uh, make them a little bit proud and sand them flush with the with the Luan and then you huh. know once you got it painted they'll be they'll disappear pretty well. Uh, the other way which might be a little more complicated would be to make your inset pieces that you pack out the door with that you could actually slip them in. So like slip them, slip half of a stop into the panel, into the hollow core, then slip your panel in there. That might be a little tricky to get the panel to fit in, but uh, I, I honestly think that packing it out, making square stops and, uh, and putting it all together and sanding and painting it would, would, would work pretty well. I don't know. Do you guys worry at all about the... Uh, door losing all its strength when you cut the center. I mean, like the whole nah. the way a Lu Luan door works <laughs> is you have a torsion box, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah I don't know. No, no, you're 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 actually adding strength. You're kind of building this like uh, you know sandwich well, truss truss system. So I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you are. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's a good experiment. If you're not, I wouldn't do a whole house this way, but maybe a couple of doors. I'd try it out. So it, it is interesting. I think I'd build, I think I would just start from scratch and build doors, especially because it's their paint grade, right? And if they're paint grade, you don't have to buy super expensive material to build your doors. And plus building doors is a fun woodworking project. Um, I think so. So if he's a, if he's an interested woodworker, you know, he might have fun trying to build a couple of doors. And I don't think cost is, it doesn't seem to me like cost really, I mean, it doesn't seem like cost is a real issue here for two doors. Um, but that's no, it. I, it's not two doors. It's five, seven, nine, ten, uh, 11 doors. Oh, uh, I'd still do them because doing, <laughs> doing, doing that process 11 times. Now it's even worse. So you got to work with the hollow core door 11 times, but okay. So forget, forget about the cost thing. Um, and maybe this was in the YouTube video. I didn't watch it, but the only thing that came to mind is that cutting hollow core doors can be tricky that you, they can get really chippy. You know, especially because mm. the, the material, you know, the material flexes and there can be a lot of tear up. So I think about how you're going to avoid that, you know, oh, so he panel, needs to go panel blade on your circular saw. Panel blades you can get for really just a few bucks and they work great. And maybe some, you know, maybe use some masking tape or other other ways to keep that door from getting. Well, all so the carpenter up. in the video used a shooting board. And we should tell folks it's a great. piece of that plywood that goes right along the kerf and it prevents the. Uh, spinning saw blade as it exits the cut from tearing up the grain it, you know it, it holds it down yeah you can make a cheap shooting board out of some scraps of plywood but see i think he should go out and buy like a thousand dollar track saw set up with one of the little, the little panel cutting reverse <laughs> blades on it it has that feature for like uh, cutting veneer like you would have on a, a sliding table saw so uh he should invest in about fifteen hundred dollars worth of equipment <laughs> <laughs> to make his to make his fifty dollar doors, <laughs> I I said the same thing. So he and I had a, a little correspondence, and uh, I was talking with him, and I was like, "To me, this makes no sense unless it's a budget." And he's like, "I could I could afford doors, like Brian suggests." And I was like, "This is an exercise, right? This is something you want to do." And he thought he did so. I said, no matter what he does, this is a, what he, he should buy a track saw. Oh, because... that, makes, that makes me even more certain that he should build his own doors. If he's got the time <laughs> to do this, if he does, and if he's got the money and if he wants an exercise, why exercise your skills doing something like so odd? <laughs> well, you're not actually, hey, building, come on. Like, you're not actually right, building woodworking skills. Like if you build doors, you can practice your mortise and, uh, mortise and tendon joints. You can like actually build your woodworking skills. I told him to buy door blanks and fit them to the existing openings, which is a great finished carpentry skill. That's like, a great skill too. Yeah. And and the track saw is perfect for that too, because inevitably you have to cut the doors and that's the fastest way to put the bevel on the latch side, you know, so you, you absolutely have to buy a track saw, Wayne. <laughs> 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 so... Brian, you're saying make doors. Rob, you're saying... I like your idea, Patrick, too. 
So I'm going to go with with the, my top two choices are make doors or buy buy doors and fit them. And Rob, you're saying uh, alter your existing Lua on doors as a my, fun exercise. I say try it on one and see how you like it. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, what's your what, what you're going to be the deciding vote here? Yeah, I'm I'm with Brian. It's like give tr- make them or buy them. So if you guys were making doors briefly, like how, how, what's the method? What what are we doing? Are we buying a domino too? I mean, we're going all in anyway, right? Yeah, I guess. There, I mean, there's so many ways to go. You could do you could do traditional mortise and tenon joints that you um, you know that you cut on table saw with table saws and routers and whatnot. You could use a new kind of tool like a domino to do your joinery. Um, we had a Andy Engel, I think, wrote a story about an. A, um, entry door that he built that he used sort of this sandwich technique. So the door had about three layers, which is, um, and I've seen that technique used in other projects. And, and you can use pocket screws, which are super cheap and fast to do yeah, that method, right? Do because that method, you, you can use pocket screw joinery. And it's probably, that's probably thinking about it, that's probably a great method for, uh, you know, this style of door. Um, because right, those panels would just be a layer. Um, so there's, there's a number of ways and they're all fun projects. It's just a matter of like what tools you have, maybe what you want to learn to do, if anything, how much time you want to put into it. Um, yeah, there's a lot of great methods for building interior doors. Uh, Kevin, if you want to hang doors, um, Gary Katz did an article a long time ago in Fine Home Building, and we'll put that on the show notes page. But it teaches you how to put a door in an existing opening, and the method is uh, – some people would describe it a, as a little unconventional, but the advantage is it's way more foolproof. You, you don't make – there's less risk of cutting a door that you have to throw away because obviously if you cut the door too small, you're done. <laughs> it's game over, right? So I know we've had a few articles over the years on making doors. I know Chris Green did one where he was doing some interesting – stuff with uh vacuum veneering but that's a little more complicated yeah. but i fa- but i found uh paul levine in issue 192 did a build your own interior door and it's exactly what we're talking about it's uh, it's loose tenon joinery and applied moldings to hold the panels in and uh i don't know Take a i look. did a big countertop blew up with chris green using that vacuum press that he has um uh, which is which is what it's what an amazing tool that is <laughs> I mean, glue ups, yeah. glue ups are always a stressful situation, but, but what an amazing, and that doesn't change with a vacuum press. In fact, in this case, it may, might've made it even more stressful because we had to maneuver this big countertop in, you know, inside a vacuum press, but what a neat tool. So you were putting veneer on like MDF or something? What were you doing? No, this was just like, it was a glue up. We were, we were making a countertop and he chose to use a vacuum press to, um, for the glue up. Oh, like a butcher block kind of thing yeah. or was Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Neat. That's cool. I got to see that. <laughs> yeah. It's just a cool, it's a, I mean, you would, it, it's hard to imagine that a vacuum would give, give you the strength you need, you know, the same, same kind of strength that clamps give you. Right. But it, it, it's, it does. And it's amazing. Well, they yeah, pick I'm, up like enormous pieces of stone and glass with, you know, pretty right. small suction cups. I mean, it's, uh, that's incredible, right? Yeah. This comes from Mako Builds uh, on our uh, Fine Home Building Forum. I thought we'd do something a little different and answer one of those questions today. So Mako Builds has what is a pretty common scenario. Uh, They want to eliminate bearing posts in their basement to open up the living space. And of course, there's a number of ways to do that, Um, but I'm going to... Uh, briefly talk about the building and then we'll talk about the methods that he identifies as potential solutions to his problem. Um, I'm planning to renovate the basement of my attached three-story townhouse. My goal is to create an open layout room in the back third of the basement. The building was built 100 years ago and it's 20 by 60. The first floor basement ceiling the first floor slash basement ceiling is supported by two by eight joists, rough sawn, that run perpendicular to the length of the building, spaced 16 inches on center. The rest of the thick sidewalls are made of rubble. They also rest on a six by eight beam rough sawn that's true dimensional that runs down the center of the building. The beam is pocketed into the front and back walls of the building and is supported by steel posts. Starting at the front of the building, the posts are spaced about five and a half feet apart, but the last post is about 15 feet from the back wall. 
The back section of the beam is supported by a cinder block wall, which is part of the existing boiler room. I hope to relocate the boiler room and remove the beam posts and cinder block walls in the back 20 feet of the house. An architect I spoke with told me that the beam and posts are load stiffening, not load bearing, but the support lost by removing them will need to be replaced. Does that sound legit to you guys? Do people just put posts in arbitrarily to, I mean, load stiffening, is that a thing? That's not, a, I've never <laughs> heard that term before. I mean, like you talk about stiffening when you like put in blocking of joints and stuff, but like, I mean, if unless you, it, unless he was unless what he was trying to say was that you don't that you don't actually need that that you can get there, away without that it, being right? there. The spans, you know, the the every, you know the size of the material and the spans are acceptable. Someone must have put it in just to stiffen up the floor system. You if know, that's you what know, he's I, saying, then then you know maybe that's legit. You got. I, I could actually see double that. check that though, right? You 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 think that might be true, Rob? I could see that because actually I did the same thing. A friend of mine helped me with a uh, put to put a beam when we put a new kitchen floor in because my uh, this sounds like my house actually. <laughs> Two by eight <laughs> roughs on roughs on rubble foundation and uh, our kitchen had such a dip in it and it was so bouncy that we put a beam in with a lolly column and it, one ends resting on the foundation wall and um, and. For that, that exact reason. So, because the thing is, a lot of old houses are underframed from a deflection standpoint, but not from a load bearing standpoint. Well, and a bounce, right? You, yeah. you also yeah. Yeah, you have bouncing is a common problem. Um, so there are three methods spelled out here. And uh, method one, this these were recommendations from the architect. Method one, sistering the existing joints with nine and a quarter inch deep LVLs. This seems like a relatively clean solution, but I do wonder how well this would hold up compared to the existing posts, beams, and cinder block walls. Uh, and it's gonna be expensive if you're talking about buying tons of uh, LVL, right? Uh, method two is replace the section of wood beam with a 20 foot steel beam. I'm not sure the exact size of the beam that would be needed yet. It would definitely cut into the headroom. So they're talking about putting a steel undergirder in mm -hmm. place of the wood one. And presumably it would hang down less because you can get more strength out of a steel beam than you can a wood one. Method three, replace the section of wood beam with recessed LVL beam. This would entail making temporary walls, cutting out the middle section of the existing joists, fitting the new LVL between them, and then attaching the cut ends of the joist to the sides of the new beam with joist hangers. If I'm reading the tables correctly, this LVL beam would have to be at least seven by 18 inches deep to span 20 feet, that is a monster. So I don't, how, how, what's one and three quarters into seven? <laughs> it was a four, <laughs> four ply beam, right? So, wow, 18, 18 inches, that's, I mean, so that doesn't really, does that even really save you anything? Well, it eliminates then, posts, but it, yeah. it, it's, it's gonna uh, definitely cut into the headroom, right? Yeah, because before I got to that part of the description, I was like, "Oh yeah, that's that'd be totally the way I would go. Just build a an inset, you know, a, a set, let in a a, a new uh, beam. But if it's gonna have to be eighteen inches tall, is that I don't know. I guess it all it's all about what are his priorities here. You know? There is one fourth possible option is to recess a steel beam, mm -hmm. right? Sure. And use top mounted hangers and i don't know how the heck you're gonna do that or you have to pack out the web of the beam with lumber to then use face mounted hangers well, and a shortcut and to this problem is an anthony power beam which uh, is sold by a number of distributors and that's an i-beam that already has the inside packed out and the loads you can get on these things are amazing and i think it's an elegant solution because it allows you to use face mount hangers which are going to work way better in a retrofit solution if you uh, were building this new, you could use tom out hangers, right? But we can't do that. Yeah, and you know, and in, in most most situations where I've seen people have a tight space to get an LVL beam in is that they uh, get an engineer to size a flitch plate. So they'll have a steel plate in between two LVLs. Very and good. that's a really simple way to do it because you go to your local steel guy and it's much cheaper than a steel beam. And they'll um, even drill, drill it for you, yeah, right? Yeah, they punch or, they'll punch or drill the holes. You just tell them what you want, where you want the holes. And that that is a good carpenter's alternative to, to a steel beam. Yeah, we've seen that um, not too long ago when someone was retrofitting a, a ridge beam and it, it, was a, it was a remarkably long span and that, that was the solution. Um, was just a couple, of, a couple of LBLs with that steel flitch plate in and it worked great. 
And, but I like and, Pat, I, Patrick. I like I, I like both of those ideas. I like the last two ideas: the flitch plate idea and that recessed um, steel. Beam, steel yeah. Beam. yeah. But whatever you do, it's basically gonna you're gonna want an engineer to specify it. Of course. Here's another caution: is that beam that's currently let into the stone masonry. Those have a bad habit of rotting away, so you you definitely want to check that out, or out while you're doing these structural repairs, because now would be the time to, you know, transfer that load path to a pilaster or some kind of post m interior of the basement wall, right? For sure. Yeah. Cool project. I wish I was there. I love this kind of stuff. You you know, you guys hear me like talk about. I don't like a lot of carpentry projects, but like structural repairs, I really get into. Cool. You can come over and do that same job to my house because I'm, <laughs> I'm planning and eliminating that beam I put in and letting it in with LVLs, Patrick. So uh, I did that in my house in Stowrom, like while we were living in it. Uh, and my friend described it as like, aren't, isn't that like replacing this, your spine of your house? It's like, yeah, it is kind of <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, but you put two temporary spines in temporarily, you know, but while you're doing it. Yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> temporary walls are a cheap way to you know hold up loads and well, uh not not today with the price of lumber they aren't <laughs> well that's no. true right that's but true. often if you're like if he's finishing this basement space often he's going to reuse those those yeah. sticks anyway for sure yeah. yeah 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 always make temporary walls out of things you can reuse later that's a good point yeah i'll tell you what i did is i uh took um a pair of adjustable lolly columns for my temporary wall and put them under like two or three doubled up or two or three two by sixes, right? And it gives you a space you can walk through as yeah. opposed to if you're putting a stud 16 inch or 24 inch centers, like if you're wearing a tool belt and carrying tools and stuff, it gets to be kind of a pain. But if you put the lolly columns in there, you can also uh, make sure that you're loading your temporary wall before you take start taking things out. That's a good yeah, idea. Good. And those things don't cost very much either. No, they don't yeah. cost much at all. And I've got about half a dozen of those you can borrow too. <laughs> rent you can rent yeah <laughs> so we our, our final question is uh it's it's from a special person rob do you want to describe where this came from um well i didn't actually read the question but i know it came from chris casey one of our uh fellow uh taunton press staff who helps he, he's been around uh a lot longer than any of us have on this uh on these websites and uh, magazines, so but uh, I don't know exactly what he, what he does. So can you explain what he, what he does? I, I, it's it's kind of top secret. I can't really tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but one thing Chris does is he 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 helps us a lot with a lot of publishing and and editing a lot of the content on the websites. Um, so if you've read a magazine article or uh, watched a video on the site, there's a, or, or listened to a podcast, he actually publishes. He spends the a podcast. lot of time uh, he doing the post-production on the podcast. Yeah, right? he, he he sets up all the podcast posts uh, everywhere, where everywhere everyone listens to it. So yeah. So Patrick, now you can read the question because I, I I know there's some something about a foundation looking ugly or something. So like Chris that, so. Uh, from Connecticut says, I'd like to make my unsightly concrete foundation wall and brick chimney more attractive. What kind of paint would you recommend? Would painting or sealing them trap water or create other problems? Thanks in advance for your advice. He must be really freaking desperate to be asking us. <laughs> he listens to this show, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing is he's going to listen to this episode, so he doesn't have to ask us directly. <laughs> the truth is, I don't know. Um, I'd call a paint technical line, right? Because uh, the things you have to worry about when you paint masonry is uh, it's alkaline, so you need products that work well uh in an alkaline uh setting right and i know sherman williams for example and i'm sure ben moore and the other big companies have uh special products for this and uh, they know better than i do did you guys have any further like better advice than that i can only share one anecdotal experience and that is um of painting um concrete block foundation with it was sort of a walkout situation so a lot of the block foundation was exposed and um i did nothing special except for make sure that it was super clean i don't even think i used this a particular concrete paint prime i used i cleaned the heck out of it made sure that it didn't have any kind of you know dirt or you know oily spots or anything like that and um primed really well you know and maybe maybe even primed a few times because it it's 
you know, it's a porous surface um, and an irregular surface and painted it and it performed beautifully. Mm. You know, didn't never had never had any kind of any kind of issues with it. Chris, do not paint your brick chimney because you will regret it for the rest of your life because it is something you'll have to maintain, you know, every few years. Yeah. G- get somebody who's good at cleaning masonry. I think what you need up there is a acid wash. And, you know, once again, I don't know a lot about that process. I would want them to protect my roof. But, you know, like, I think you're asking the wrong folks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing about painting anything is it's all about the prep and knowing the compatibility of the materials and the surface. Um, I mean, in general, people, uh, rec- you know, painters recommend using TSP, trisodium phosphate, to clean a surface. If it's a masonry surface, you might also need to do some sort of an acid etch like you were suggesting. Uh, but again, these are... These are questions that we could certainly talk to our, some of our experts about, but uh, um, I haven't. So. <laughs> Jeff, you're going to tell us that you you used to be like specialized in painting masonry. I'm guessing. No, but um, I'm just I'm going to step into Matt's shoes and and what about a lime wash for the the foundation and yeah. the, the chimney? Uh, well, I'm more the foundation than the chimney, but there you go. So Chris, have Matt over to lime wash your foundation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, th- the thing about a lime wash, I think, is uh, is it's certainly a maintenance item over time. I mean, those are things mm. that need to be replenished on a on a. I'm not sure how many year basis, but it's something that's. Uh, but I think on it's the... forgiving to redo. Unlike like, so if you have a paint failure, you got to go all the way back. But it, like lime is meant to wear away, and then you just keep renewing it. If I'm not mistaken, is that yeah. what you guys think? I think it depends on the on, on the project, the surface you're working on. I'm sure that was no help, Chris, but you knew that going in, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll hear I'll hear about it later when he's publishing this post. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have anything to uh, talk about before we part company today? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, one thing you, we mentioned uh, the in, the insulation guide. We all, we've also got a lot more uh, webinars coming up um, recently. We've got at least one or two a month, it seems. So uh, we've got um, we'll just we haven't even put up the registration page up yet, but it'll be up by the time you guys uh, we we publish this. But uh, Tina Govan, we really had a great time talking with her on a webinar a while back, and we we're having her back to do one on designing outdoor spaces. And, you know, people think a lot of times think of landscape as a separate piece from their house, but her focus is is basically thinking of your outer portions of your house as an extension of your house. So that's really what the webinar is gonna be about. It's gonna be about uh, um, basically how to how to extend your practic- your your usable living space by c- thinking about designing decks and porches and other uh, patios and other outdoor spaces that that connect well to your home. So yeah, I'm Tina, looking- Tina's really smart and she's a s- small house advocate or or maybe I should say a right size house advocate. So you know outdoor spaces you know uh, become super important and she just she'll have great ideas. She had great ideas in that last in that last webinar about designing smaller spaces. Yeah, I mean, it's it's worth it to go just to look at the the photos of the, that she's going to share because she designed some beautiful homes and they just look like great fun places to live. All every single one of them that I've seen. So, I would remind looking. folks, you know, that I'll be the first to admit the podcast doesn't really really pay the bills. Uh, it taunting, but uh, if if you get a web membership or a magazine subscription, that that really helps out. And uh, please uh, go to one of the podcast. Uh, aggregators and review us it, it really 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 helps out and like the comment on youtube or leave uh likes there it, it's it helps other folks on your podcast it strengthens a brand and keeps me employed <laughs> 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 well unfortunately that is all the time we have here today thanks to rob brian and jeff for joining me and thanks to all of you for listening Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or view us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks very much for listening. Keep craft alive. <laughs>